We are going to be talking about ultrasound of the head and neck because you guys are doing that head and neck anatomy and stuff this week, I think. So we try to correlate this with uh, what's going on in your classes. So uh, we're going to be talking about the carotid arteries, specifically the thickness of the intimal medial layer and the peritonsillar region uh, using ultrasound. And we're going to talk about ultrasound of the thyroid and then ultrasound of the eyes. Uh, maybe this is better. Let me try the different light setting here. Yeah, that's better. Cool. So, the carotid arteries um, are actually the window to the coronary arteries. So it turns out that um, you can measure the thickness of the intimal medial layer, and that correlates with cardiovascular disease throughout the body. Okay, the intimal medial thickness—it's called. It's a single spot characteristic of atherosclerosis um, <clears throat> based on considerable information that the intima and media are both involved in the, in the atherogenesis process. And um, you can see the anatomical progression of the lesions uh, on ultrasound. And there's been a bunch of studies out there that have demonstrated that both increases in the intimal thickness or fibromuscular hyperplasia that's associated with aging and the, um, the medial thickness or smooth muscle hyperplasia that's associated with hypertension, even in the absence of a distinct atherosclerotic plaque. And so we can measure that, um, what we call the carotid intimal medial thickness, or CIMT, and that can actually predict a future, um, both a, a coronary heart disease event like an MI, or it can prevent, uh, predict uh, a stroke as well. And there's been a bunch of published studies to show this with uh, large numbers we can see here. This, uh, this was looking at um, 7,289 women and 5,500 men. Um, and they, what they did was they measured their carotid arteries, the intimal medial thickness. I'm going to show you, <clears throat> show you how to do that in a minute. And, and they showed that uh, if that thickness, once it's greater than 0.6 millimeters, you, especially if you're a man, you have increased rate of having... Um, either a heart attack or death from a heart attack. And, and certainly here you are at 0 0.7, 0 0.8, you know, and you get up above a, a millimeter of thickness and both women and men have much higher rates of um, coronary heart disease events. And the same is true for strokes. This is for strokes actually um, over here. And you can see that uh, once you get that carotid intimal medial thickness, when, once that starts to get greater than you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, we get up here at a millimeter, and um, one millimeter is a real problem here with having strokes. And so this is uh, one way to kind of monitor patients for risk for heart, heart attacks and strokes, but the routine use of this has not been implemented in a clinical way because nobody has access to the routine use of ultrasound at the bedside, except for you guys. And so this is something that would be potentially useful, especially in primary care, now that ultrasound is suddenly becoming very ubiquitous and it's everywhere. Um, and as that machine evolves into a much smaller, cheaper handheld device, which is happening as we speak, uh, this is something that, especially if you're in primary care or cardiology, you may find yourself really using quite a bit. There's a question in the back. Sure, so the y-axis, um, this is just controlled for uh, 1,000 patient years. So the number of um, strokes uh, adjusted for age and gender for 1,000 patient years. And that's the only way I kind of understand it, actually. It's, it's like stroke events, um, and they, they put it, they were able to create units that made sense for these integers, uh, zero, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, just because if they created these per 1,000 patient years, that's how they were able to create that simple integer, I think. That's, how they, that's why they um, did it that way. So um, if you, one group of folks looked at um, putting this into a really complicated algorithm, which I'm gonna walk you through now, just kidding. Um, but basically, this is kind of the idea that um, Here's your carotid intimal medial thickness in the percentile range here, less than 50 percentile, you can see, with some other scores. Um, and your LDL target, uh, and then 
what your retest interval is. And once you get above um, the 50th percentile for your CIMT thickness, then um, anyways, there's this complicated um, algorithm that you could use. And obviously, we're not going to memorize this right now, but I just wanted to let you know that you may find some utility for this, especially if you're entering primary care or cardiology. This is an example here of the carotid um, artery going from the, the feet up towards the head. And as you can see, there's this bifurcation, as you're all very aware, especially being in anatomy right now. You've got the uh, external carotid and the internal carotid. And that area of bifurcation is colloquially known as the carotid bulb right here. And this is the best spot to measure the carotid intimal medial thickness. And you do it against the far wall of the carotid, okay, the posterior wall of the carotid. When you put the probe anteriorly along the neck, you're going to look at that posterior wall. It's a nice perpendicular reflection, which offers a very uh, nice ultrasound image. And you can see um, along that far wall, they're kind of schematic showing it here, and you can see along this far wall, it's, it's a very thin little distance there. And in the models today, it's very difficult to appreciate it because everybody's like young. But if you come across somebody who's greater than like 50 years of age, you'll start to see this area likely become a lot more prominent and start to be easier to measure. Um, and so you put the transducer in a long axis along the carotid here, and you try to get a good length of it uh, in that common carotid for about one uh, centimeter long. This is about a centimeter in length. And just to show you, just so it stretches out in this long axis, and we can see another CIMT thickness down here, and um, there's another CIMT thickness right here. So it's that first uh, layer there in, in the in the carotid that you're going to be measuring. And you're going to measure from here to here, from this blue line to this blue line, or over here you would measure from this red line to this red line. Just a, a, just with those lines kind of demonstrate where where those areas are that you would actually drop the calipers. And so this is the the region. So that's really all there is to it. It's um, it's not a very complicated concept. It's just measuring that far wall of the carotid intimal medial thickness to have a um, serve as a surrogate marker for a risk factor for um, coronary heart disease. Now, we're going to change gears now and talk about uh, the back of the throat, but peritonsillar or abscesses. And uh, this is a place where a lot of people get um, infections, right, sore throats. Patients come in, they say, oh, I've got a sore throat, and, and they think, and they tell you, you know, doc, um, they've all just already diagnosed themselves with strep throat, and they want antibiotics, and you know, whether you give them antibiotics or not, that's a discussion for another time. But um, w as an emergency physician, at least, um, one of the things I worry about is, yeah, this is probably just a strep throat, but, you know, I'm always worried about more nefarious things that require more aggressive therapy, like a surgical drainage, and an abscess is that. Um, and we, we talk about abscesses all over the body, but in the back of the throat, it's difficult to tell if somebody has an abscess. So what happens around the country is that when a patient comes in, and a doctor looks in the back of their throat, and the uvula is off to one side, a little bit shifted, and the patient's got some pain in their jaw or trismus, or some fullness in the back of their uh, peritonsillar region, that the doctor almost knee-jerk orders a CT scan of that area. And most of these patients are young, and it's like getting 350 chest x-rays with the radiation to that thyroid area that uh, is a very sort of, you know, uh, cancer-prone organ with radiation exposure. So we try to limit that radiation when we can, and of course ultrasound plays very nicely into this, not only for um, diagnosis, but also for treatment. One of the things you got to be careful with, though, is like this 12-year-old guy right here that uh, we're doing this on, you don't actually want to call it an endovaginal transducer at that point, because as soon as they hear that, they immediately spit the thing out. So, um, <laughs> I mean, you could call it the endocavitary probe, you know, or the oral probe. That almost sounds worse. I just call it, you know, the ultrasound thing. And then to make matters worse, you end up putting a condom on it. And that's, and, uh, that's always kind of weird to, to do that. And, and, um, but, you know, it's got to be done because that's what really um, keeps, the, keeps it clean and stuff. And, uh, but the patients, once they find out what it's used for, um, I had a very funny case about two years ago where, uh, this young kid, we're, I, I, what I do is I hand the, pick the probe to the patient. I have them inserted in their mouth, and then they can rest their teeth gently on the, um, on the probe. And the guy's sister, who was um, you know, older, like eight years older than, than him, looks at him and looks at the situation. He starts laughing. And she's like, that's, you know, and she starts explaining what it's for. And 
you know, rightfully so, you immediately spit it out. So you don't want to <laughs> let on with where it's been, where the probe's been used for. Um, so this is, what, this is what an abscess looks like here in the back of the throat. So this is the endovaginal footprint transducer. And this is all the oral sort of mucosa back here. And um, some of this stuff is air because, you know, you're back there by air-filled structures like esophagus and trachea. But actually, this area right here, this hypoechoic area right here is where the, um, there's actually a needle coming in. I don't know if you can see that little needle poking in right there. It's a little bit off axis, off plane, but sometimes you can make out that needle coming in right there. It's coming into the abscess. So we can localize these things. Um, if they're small abscesses, we can get to it with a needle and just aspirate the pus back in a needle. Other times, though, we need to take a scalpel, an 11 blade, and, and just slice it open and let the pus drain out the back of the throat. And right away, you're wondering, um, how, what do you do with all that pus? It's draining down. You know, it's kind of gross. It's like draining down into the esophagus, or worse, it could go into the trachea. So we, we actually, when we're doing this procedure, we've got the endovatch transducer in the mouth. We're sliding the needle against, right up against the edge of the transducer, but we take a, a suction um, a Yankow or sucker, and we basically take the tongue and push down on it to get in there with our needle, and then as we see the pus draining out, we immediately get the sucker against that hole we created, and the pus starts going into the Yankow. So that's, we suck out the pus that way, and so usually not a lot of it goes down. But um, the other thing is patients are sometimes in a lot of pain, almost always in a lot of pain back here, so you can give them some hurricane spray, some, it's like this benzocaine spray, that uh, numbs the area in the back of the throat up pretty well. And, um, and it it's actually doesn't even taste that bad. And patients actually tolerate this uh, surprisingly well. If they're still having a lot of apprehension or they have a lot of trismus, trismus is difficulty opening up the jaw, pain in the, the TMJ because of um, all this local infection and swelling, then um, you can give them a medication like a short-acting benzodiazepine called Versed. And, um, or my dazzle and we use that uh, quite a bit. And it's like the patient immediately feels like they've had about six margaritas and they don't care what you're doing. Um, this is an example here of not abscesses, but bilateral pharyngeal enlarged lymph nodes. And so they're hyperechoic and they're, they're bilateral. And as the patient swallows, sometimes you'll see them come together like right there, a little bit closer. They move when the patient swallows. and. And um, sometimes it's difficult to tell whether you're looking at an abscess or whether you're actually looking at um, pharyngeal um, lymphadenopathy. And one of the things you can do to tell the difference is you could put actually color flow or power flow Doppler on the lymph node, on the thing in question, and the lymph node will light up like this, like a Christmas tree, whereas um, an abscess doesn't have flow to it. It's just a pocket of pus. And so, but you can see how hyperemic or engorged uh, an active lymph node gets when it's trying to fight an infection in the back of the throat. Now, this ne next example is a very large peritonsillar abscess uh, that we saw, and we can see that sort of, this is all the area here that is pus in the middle of this here. And this structure back here, this is the carotid artery running off in the background. So you gotta be careful that when you're incising these, you don't hit big red, and uh, that would cause an expanding hematoma and the throat and could potentially cause an airway obstruction. So that's one of the things we all worry about when we're draining these things. And the nice thing about ultrasound is that I can guide uh, my needle down, uh, I can measure from the back of the throat into the abscess, and that's how far I have to go. This is after we drained the abscess. You can see there's almost complete uh, resolution compared to how it was uh, before we were draining it. Now, the nice thing about ultrasound is you can tell whether you got all the pus out or not. This is just another example here of a peritonsillar abscess, this hypoechoic area. We take our calipers from the, from the mucosa in the back of the throat, we drop it down, and we can just measure how far the minimum distance the needle is going to need to travel in, in through past the skin line, or the mucosal line, in order to get into, the, um, into this abscess material. So another nice thing about ultrasound. This uh, next example that we're going to see is a very large abscess here. And as we push the probe, put a little pressure on it, we can see, whoops, no, sorry. We can see this material um, swirl and, oh, that was wrong. Whoa. Wait for it. Here we go. So we can see this material swirl as we gently insert the probe a little bit further. Can you see it move a little bit as we get? This is all pus back here that does that. And we do that on the skin a lot and soft tissue abscesses. You're going to learn a lot about that next year. But this is just an example of all this pus kind of swirling in the back of the throat and very large peritonsillar abscess. Pretty easy to drain. You just need to, you know, incise through this area, and you'll see all the pus start to drain out. 
switching gears again to the thyroid and um, to assess a patient for thyroid disease, um, we do a lot of blood tests um, we, um, that you're going to learn about, like the thyroid stimulating hormone, free T4, free T3, um, and also some thyroid antibody tests. And so we sent off those blood tests, but you know they take a while to come back. Um, even from the emergency department, I can't get any thyroid test back sooner than about 48 hours, and so and that's not too helpful for me in my clinical practice. But what's nice is that I can roll up with the ultrasound machine and I can take a look at anything in the thyroid. It's very easy to see. You'll see it today. It looks very, very prominent, very easy structure to identify. And if somebody has a mass in their thyroid or some swelling over their thyroid, I can assess whether I'm looking at um, an actual cystic nodule or a solid nodule. Cystic nodules are jet black. Solid has echogenicity to them. And sometimes a cystic nodule will have an area of it that is, has a solid component. We can make that on an ultrasound. And we can tell if there's multi-nodularity or multiple nodules around. We can identify how they look and where they are. And also identify um, lymph nodes. Because sometimes you think you're palpating the thyroid where it's just a very anterior cervical lymph node. Um, now, one of the things about ultrasound you get to realize, though, is that you cannot distinguish truly a benign lesion from a malignant lesion. I'm going to show you a bunch of examples of things that point to just a benign thing from a malignant thing, but basically it's really difficult with ultrasound. It's not specific enough. So you end up doing fine needle aspirations on the majority of these thyroid uh, masses. And we all know there's the advantages of ultrasound. It's obviously inexpensive, accessible, it's not invasive. You don't have to inject any, you know, isotopes or anything like that into the patient. And um, you can see the whole thyroid, um, transverse and, and long axes. Um, and um, sometimes you come across an unsuspected thyroid nodule that you wouldn't have ever palpated with a physical exam. And some advocate the use of ultrasound for early uh, detection of thyroid cancer. And it turns out that there was a, a couple studies that have shown that there's a similar rate of thyroid cancer actually in those non-palpable thyroid nodes, the ones that the physical exam misses and the ultrasound picks up. There's a similar rate of malignant cancer in those nodules that there are in the ones that you, that you can actually feel with a physical exam. And so that's one argument to consider the use for screening with thyroid. Yes? Um, a diffuse process in the thyroid is generally speaking a goiter that's due to Graves' disease or an autoimmune. I have an example of that coming up. Um, but the cancers are usually focal nodules, focal nodularity. Now this is what a normal thyroid looks like and, um, and uh, it's interesting, this tissue is very isoechoic um, material and to be frank with you, it looks exactly like the same echogenicity of the testicle. And I say that because I teach a lot of urologic ultrasound to the urology residents, and next year you're going to get a lot of this from me too. And sometimes it's difficult to find a testicle model when you go to the hands-on scanning, and what we end up turning to is the thyroid as an example of what the testicle would look like, because it's really the same sort of tissue appearance, almost identical. So um, keep that in mind today. I mean, this glandular tissue, you know, it has this sort of appearance to it. And uh, we can see the trachea, that's this hyperechoic structure right here, and then this is just some artifact seen down here, some reflection artifact of the thyroid that's above the trachea when, it, when the trachea is air-filled in this particular axis. So that's a short axis view. We can see the left thyroid here, the isthmus, and then over here to the right thyroid. Now we move the probe into the long axis. I think that's the coolest view of the thyroid because it stretches out. You can see what a big organ it is. It's amazing how large it is on ultrasound. I'm told that it's, it's a little bit underwhelming in the, um, the cadaver lab when you finally get to the thyroid. It's not, you expect this beautiful thing to jump off the table at you. And on ultrasound, it really jumps off the screen pretty well. You can make out the vasculature, uh, both the um, arterial venous vasculature. When you put color on it, the thing, you can see a lot of these blood vessels and make sure you practice a little bit of that today during the hands-on session. Now, when you use color Doppler to remind you, there's something called the PRF. Does anybody remember what that stands for? the pulse repetition frequency. It's the number of pulses per second that the ultrasound Doppler is using to check for the Doppler shift of a moving red blood cell moving through a blood vessel, okay? So the more times it's sending out pulses, the less it's listening, okay? So when your PRF is high, 
you're sending a lot of pulses, you're doing a lot of talking, you're not doing a lot of listening. Okay, so my wife would tell you that I have a very high PRF sometimes. I'm just blabbing and not listening. Now, that makes me a pretty insensitive husband to her, okay? So, in the sense that if I lower my PRF, if I'm not talking as much and I'm listening more, I'm a more sensitive individual because I'm listening more. And so is the Doppler on the ultrasound machine. So, low pulse repetition frequency, better sensitivity, okay? Just keep that in mind, PRF. You're gonna come across that PRF all over the place next year, yes. So, like if the blood flow through the carotid, it's like so robust and so right there next to the probe. If you have a low PRF in that case, the whole thing is just, you can't even, it's just all um, over, it's oversensitive and, and you can't get a good uh, crisp picture of the flow there. So you need to turn up the PRF in high velocity blood vessels like the carotid, like the aorta. But when you're looking at the little tiny blood vessels in the testicle, the ovary, the thyroid, then you want a low PRF. You want to be more sensitive in those, have a higher sensitivity in those organs, which there's another joke in there somewhere I can't make right now because I'm tired. Um, <laughs> so the color grading system, when you do have a nodule, okay, so now we're talking about pathology, talking about nodules. So one way to tell whether something is an active nodule or a um, possibly malignant nodule is this color grading system. So if you have a grade one, there's no color flow mapping at all inside the nodule. Okay, so a cystic nodule, they're grade ones because it's just fluid there and there's no blood there. And so blood vessel there. And so they're all grade ones. Now, if you move on to a grade two, you get some peripheral flow. Grade three, the flow penetrates a little bit more. There's moderately rich vasculature. Grade four is high velocity penetrating vascular rich um, flow. So I'll show you some examples. So category one is no flow at all. Category two is, you can see it here, it's, it's, it's actually out here in the periphery of this, of this nodule, this thyroid nodule. So this is not just the thyroid gland, this is a nodule within the thyroid gland. I wanna be clear about that. We're looking at talking about the pathology of the nodules now, the thing that the patient's you know, coming and complaining over, you happen to pick up on your ultrasound. Grade two, peripheral only. Um, this is an example here of just the grayscale first of this entire nodule, okay? It's got um, this cystic component with some echoes in it. That's how I would describe this. And I would measure it, you know, from out here all the way across to here. And you can see there's a caliper that was dropped there. And I'd probably measure from up here all the way down to likely down to and well, actually maybe down to here, kind of hard to tell the transverse view. But you know, we're seeing all these echoes in here and then we see this other solid component to it up here. And you know, this is really the area that I'm gonna be a little bit more focused on because I'm wondering to myself, hmm, is that just some of the echogenic debris that is settled out here or is this actually a different component of this whole nodular system? So when I put flow on there, now I can see this has got some category two to it right here. There's some peripheral flow going on in this nodule. And yes, it is distinct from this other cystic component. This is not just some debris that's layered out. This has got its own sort of world going on right here. And that's something that um, was um, guided for fine needle aspiration. So that's the next step in these is to do a fine needle aspiration or FNA. You're going to hear that term all the time. Okay. It's basically a biopsy. You can take an ultrasound needle, guide it down under ultras you can, ultrasound needle. You can take a needle and guide it through the skin line into this nodule and grab a piece of it and send it off to the lab and uh, and find out what's going on. This one happened to be benign. Yes. So it's just like an ultrasound. Yeah, if I didn't see blood flow there, I'm I'm gonna kind of lump this over in the um, in the uh, cystic component and. Um, and be less concerned about this being a cancer structure. I'm gonna to come to kind of what to do here in a second with regard to these. Keep that thought in mind. But first, this is a category three. You can see it's got some moderately rich penetrating vascular um, flow to it. So normal thyroid down here, we come up, this is the isthmus, normal, 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 normal here. Here's the carotid, here's the carotid here. And this is just another little blood vessel that you guys would know more about than I would anatomically. It's some, one of the blood vessels that feeds the thyroid. So that's not something like a nodule or something over here. But this thing here is its own island going on over here. It's got moderately rich flow to it. 
And um, this is something you're definitely going to want to put a needle into and grab a, grab a biopsy. But you can see there's more vascularity. It's not just peripheral. It's a lot of penetrating vascular flow there that we're going to want to get a bead on. This is category four. It's um, got a, a vascularly rich um, pattern to it. Uh, we can see it's definitely um, got some, a lot of penetration going on here. And this other component over here has a lot of penetration. You know, this gets to the idea of still images versus video. Video just has such more of a, tells so much more of a story to me than an isolated still image does. And so this is one where I'm gonna really wanna see the grayscale and then the color with the video component. So this is two still images. We can see this, so down here is normal thyroid and it's going over here towards the isthmus. So this is this nodule here that's on this, on this thyroid gland. And um, it's got some different heterogeneous components to it. And when you put the flow on, it's got a lot of, you know, sort of category four um, uh, high vascularity to it. And this one was biopsied and showed that it was papillary carcinoma. So some of the red flags getting at which ones do you biopsy or which ones can you kind of not worry about as much, it's this. So males have higher rates of cancer than females do. And the extremes of age, less than 20 years or greater than 60 years. If there's a rapid change, so this patient's come to your clinic, you see them one week and the next week it looks different to you or two weeks later it looks different, that's a sign that it could be cancer. Um, greater than a four centimeters, the larger it is, the more likelihood. And then finally, if there's symptoms of local invasion, like the patient's voice is getting hoarse or they have trouble swallowing, those are all um, more likelihood of, of, of cancer in those situations. And what happens when you do a fine needle aspiration or you, or you grab a biopsy of it, what are the, what are the outcomes? Well, um, interestingly, uh, the good news is they're benign about 69% of the time, and then you bring the patient back in about six to 12 months and you, and you reassess it, okay? And about 17% of the time, you get an insufficient sample and you have an inconclusive result. Now, depending how suspicious you were about that nodule, you may redo it uh, in the next few days or wait a few months, and so this sort of depends. And um, when you have one that comes back not benign, not sufficient, not insufficient, but suspicious of those, which luckily it's only 10%, um, of those, well, it turns out 85% go on to become just benign adenomas, okay? The other ones are actually follicular neoplasms. And then finally, um, of all the biopsies that you do, about 5% are malignant. Um, what about Graves' disease? Well, Graves' disease is where you have the, did you guys learn about this a little bit already? Cool. So it's where you have the, it's like an autoimmune thing. You get the antibodies get set up against the receptors in the thyroid. You start producing all this, um, uh, you know, the thyroid um, hormone and the, the goiter results because the thyroid gland's getting really revved up and it's getting really hypervascular. And, and some of those antibodies go to the muscles that are in the, around the eye. And so these eyes get proptotic or bulge out because not because the eyes are big, but the muscles around the eye are getting so enlarged from all this auto-antibody thing going on. So um, that's something to, uh, to think about. So when I see a patient with their eyes are bugging out like that, I start looking at their necks, and then I start grabbing for the ultrasound machine. This is one patient who had Graves' disease in my emergency department, though she was under treatment for it. She still had a very large goiter, but you can see here just on the grayscale ultrasound, um, there was parts of this goiter that was starting to, to kind of pull back or, or degenerate or get more cystic or anechoic in nature. So it's not as, as hyperechoic and diffuse, uh, and diffusely hyperechoic, but there's some areas that are anechoic because she was actually under treatment, and she said the goiter had come way down from where she started um, several months ago. So, um, but this is just an example of, of what a, a, a goiter under treatment would look like. Now we're going to talk about some of the grayscale characteristics of these thyroid nodules. You can see here, this one's got some hyperechoic punctate lesions here in this thyroid nodule. And uh, when I see those, I know that that's highly suggestive of a malignancy. There's no comet tails coming down, okay? They're just hyperechoic punctate echogenicities, no comet tails. That's worrisome when we see those in the nodule. As opposed to when we see other punctate lesions, like this one right here, this is very subtle, but this punctate lesion here does have a, um, a comet tail to it. And maybe there's another little comet tail here, really hard to see. I, I, I struggle to see these as well, but when there's comet tails, um, that's consistent with having colloid crystals in the, um, in the thyroid, and that, that will, that's benign process. And so that's more likely to be benign if you see 
the common tails. So if you see a thyroid nodule and there's no common tails to it and there's punctate areas that are not common tailing, that's the ones you really want to sort of ramp up your suspicion for. Um, this one here is just a very isoechoic, nice, solid-looking nodule um, within the rest of the normal thyroid tissue. Unfortunately, this one turned out to be uh, papillary carcinoma. This is a, a cystic one, a very cystic nodule. These are very, very common to see these cystic nodules within people's thyroid glands. And most um, endocrinologists would probably tell you, you know, as long as it's not changing in size, bring them back, follow it closely, but you may not need to biopsy these very cystic um, anechoic ones without any complex nature to them at all. This is the uh, internal jugular of the carotid we've seen a second ago. And this is the very sort of complex thyroid um, lesion on the left. This is the right thyroid, very normal looking. Over here we get to the left side and there's this complex mass seen in this patient's thyroid that we, that we saw in our emergency department. Here we are going to the long axis. So we refer this patient um, out for a biopsy, and um, and I got curious about this, so I followed it up, and it turned out to be benign. So they went for a fine needle aspiration. That was, even though it has all this sort of complex cystic, cystic nature to it, with, I'm sorry, it's got a cystic nature, but it's got some complex areas to it. It turned out to be benign. So um, bottom line is when you come across these things, you want to notify your attending that you're working with, and, uh, and you know, sort of work together to decide what the next step should be. If it's very cystic looking, maybe you just follow it. But if there's any of those suspicious findings, especially with those flow patterns being higher and punctate equigenicities, um, and those are the ones you really want to sort of lean on for the biopsy. Okay, last topic, the eye. And ultrasound is quite useful in the eye. We can see the anatomy. I'm going to talk about how you do it with the technique. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the pathology that you can see, especially with regards to the optic nerve sheath diameter, retinal, and vitreous detachments. Now, this is a pretty classic story that comes in. I see this almost daily in the emergency department, believe it or not. A lot of eye complaints. And, um, and so, you know, somebody comes in, they're having like blurry vision, and, um, and we, do, we check their visual fields, and there's a, there's a unilateral visual defect on, um, on one of the left eye. And, um, and so we go to examine it with the fundoscope, but we're having some trouble there because you know, the pupil's sort of constricted, the patient's a little apprehensive, and um, we're having a tough time getting in there. You know, we can dilate the eye if we need to, but then you know, there's certain situations where we don't know what the diagnosis is yet, so if you dilate the eye in a certain um, condition, um, you can cause a lot of problems, uh, like with glaucoma. So you gotta be careful in certain situations. So, you know, we turn to uh, ultrasound in these situations because it gets very difficult to see the back of the eye, to see the retina. And that's the main thing we're worried about. One of the main things is that the retina can detach away from the choroid of the eye. And uh, have you guys had eye anatomy yet? Are you doing it right now? Cool, okay. So when that retina pulls away from the back of the choroid, um, it's a life-threatening, not life-threatening, it's a vision-threatening emergency. And so, um, so, and this is what this looks like. This is the eye here, and this is the retina here detached away from the back of the eye. We can see it laterally, and this is called, an, um, and by the way, this is the optic nerve right here with the, the shadow coming down, and this is where the macula is, and the retina is still attached at the macula. So this is what we call a mac-on retinal detachment, and this is, a, this is the, like one of our biggest ocular emergencies we could ever have. So we're on the phone right away with our nice uh, ophthalmology colleagues, and we explain to them that we have a mac-on retinal detachment, or it's still attached at the macula. And that's what's happening, right? The retina is pulling back away from the other parts of the, the other part of the eye from the choroid. It's still attached up here at the aura serrata. But because it's starting to get near the macula, the patient is having these weird symptoms of like, yeah, I can see okay now, but once in a while it feels like a shade is being pulled down, or I see a bunch of floaters in my vision, and and you're like, um, but I'm checking your visual acuity now, it's normal. It's these kind of like waxing and waning cases that are coming and going they are the most concerning actually, rather than just frank blindness. When you have frank blindness because the retina just totally rips off the macula, those, um, there's not as big of a surgical emergency. Once it's MAC off, there's not a lot you can do. But it's the MAC on ones, the ones that present sort of atypically, those are the ones you gotta be very careful about. So, um, with ultrasound, we can see the anterior chamber, the vitreous cavity. We can do a kinetic exam, meaning we can have the patient look left, look right, look up, look down. And um, because the eye is so superficial, we can use the high-frequency transducer to get beautiful images of it. This is what 
um, a retinal attachment looks like on the physical exam using your phonoscope. Now, this is a beautiful image that you see in textbooks. Very hard for me, struggling with this awesome device, the ophthalmoscope, I really struggle trying to get this image, okay? This to me is a very challenging thing. Um, I wish I was better at it. I try, but you know, it, I, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, especially in an eye that's got a dilated, that's got a constricted pupil. I haven't given up on it though, I'm still trying. Um, and someday hopefully um, I'll get some, I'll get better at it. But this is, um, this is one of the things that's hard, to, that's hard to do, I think, with a physical exam. Especially if you have somebody who's got an opacified anterior chamber. Think um, about somebody who's got um, blood in the anterior chamber, like a hyphema, or somebody who's got a cataract, or some blockage. Now, you're really stuck if you can't get through that pupil to see the, the back of the eye, right? So um, optic neuritis can cause a lot of pain, which um, can be difficult to, uh, to use the ophthalmoscope with. And then if there's foreign bodies, of course, the patient's having a lot of pain, and the foreign body can block the visual field, and you, it's hard to see the back of the eye. I could go on and on about the problems with this, but that's what's nice about ultrasounds because, um, first of all, um, not every place is like UCI where I could sneeze and I could have an ophthalmologist come down to my emergency department right away, okay? It's really, really easy for us to get ophthalmology consultations, but that's not the case everywhere, okay? You could be out in the primary care setting or somewhere where there's not a lot of resources and, you know, you, you have to rely on your own skills. You'd be a lot more self-propelled in those situations. So, um, and you don't need any other fancy ophthalmologic equipment, expensive equipment. It's just the ultrasound that you're using for everything else. And um, blepharedema, that's a word that means that uh, there's a lot of swelling around the eyelid, so it's hard to see, um, it's hard to retract the eyelid, it's blocking it. And so in those patients that have a lot of edema or swelling there, the ultrasound is very useful because you just put gel over the eyelid and then you look through the gel through the closed eyelid to see the eye, and that's how we do it anyway. I mean, so even as someone whose eyelid is so swollen, um, you can still do this exam, and um, you can see all the anatomy of the eye. And actually, the other thing you can see is the pupil. And so if you, you learned about the swinging flashlight test, where um, you swing the flashlight over to the other eye, and you get, you get the afferent pupillary um, effect of the constriction in the, the non-flashlight eye, I guess that's the way to say it. Uh, thank you. Consent, con, consensual? Okay. Consensual light reflex. Thank you. Well, we call it the afferent pupillary defect when it's not intact. And that's something APD is what we're always checking for. Hard to do sometimes in a brightly lit room. Ultrasound, you can see the iris constrict in the closed eyelid, underneath the closed eyelid when you're putting light in the open eye. So you can see the iris there. So that's one, that's another kind of cool thing you could do with it. And I mean, we can see all kinds of problems with the eye pathology, like retral bulbar hematomas, retinal detachments, lens that get dislocated, vitreous hemorrhage, and foreign bodies. So the indications there, anytime somebody with ocular pain, decreased loss of vision, somebody who thinks there's a foreign body in their eye, um, a patient who describes the experience of having floaters, that's what these things are up here, where it looks like there's things in your visual field. Um, now, when I talked about floaters last time, everybody was like, hey, wait, I get that too. Like, so apparently those are pretty common. I've never had them before, but like half of you have experienced floaters before. So it seems, I don't really know. Um, but patients come to the ER a lot for this, for like, I'm seeing floaters. And that, that could be um, one of the symptoms of a retinal or a vitreous body detachment. And, um, and then we can also use this for patients with increased intracranial pressure. And so sometimes when you have an eyelid, so this person right here, this would be um, a difficult and painful uh, process. The way we, how would you retract that eyelid right there when it's that swollen? What would you do? That's right, you take a paper clip and you take two paper clips actually and you can get them underneath the eyelids and pry them open that way. But ugh, it's, patients hate this. And so um, when you have this much blepharedema or you have somebody with a big, you know, Shiner like this woman who's very happy that she's got this black eye, um, <laughs> interestingly. But you could you can do ultrasound there by putting a lot of chilled gel out there on the orbit, and uh, and you can assess what's going on, especially in patients who have altered mental status. You're not sure they could have a head injury. We can we have a way to a surrogate marker for their intracranial pressure. Briefly, the anatomy sounds like you guys are learning it. All I really wanted to just point out to you is mostly this image over here that shows the optic nerve right here coming off the back of the eye. So 
This is anterior, this is posterior. This is lateral, okay? And so the macula is lateral to the optic nerve, and it's this macula that I'm really focused on whenever I see a retinal detachment, because the retina is always tethered at two points. It's always tethered here at the optic nerve, and it's always tethered out here at the uh, aura serrata. So use a high-frequency transducer. Um, sc always scan through closed eyelids. Never put the, the ultrasound on the eyeball itself. And uh, you can have the patient look ahead first with straight with closed eyes. I like to keep a bottle of chilled gel somewhere in the refrigerator. Chilled ultrasound gel stands up on itself better, kind of makes a little ice cream cone, and you can really stand away from the eye, and that's especially critical when you, and anytime you're worried about somebody who could have a globe rupture. And you can look in the transverse and sagittal planes. Alternatively, you could take this thing called a tegaderm. A tegaderm is a sterile, uh, see-through plastic sticker that you can place on the eye, and um, and put the gel over the tegaderm. If you had somebody where there was some reason why you didn't want to put gel on their eyelid itself. Now gel is water soluble. Um, I get it in my eyes all the time whenever I'm demonstrating all heal or sound. It doesn't sting or anything, but you may have a situation where for whatever reason you don't want to get gel on the patient. Um, two views, linear transducer. This is the transverse view, so the indicator is here to the patient's right. And then the other view is sagittal, the indicator towards the patient's um, top of their scalp. And what you see here, this is the, um, the, the view here of the eye. And uh, the first thing that we see at the very top of the screen here is we see the eyelid. This is the eyelid up here. And then we can make out the anterior chamber of the eye there. And there's your lens seen just behind it. We can see the iris here. And then between the edges of the iris, this is the pupil right here. And then there's the other iris over here. So most of the time when I'm looking on ultrasound, the pupil is pretty big, right? Because the eye is closed when we're doing the ultrasound. And so the pupil dilates when there's no light. And so that's why we can see these really wide pupils whenever we're doing an ocular ultrasound because the eye is closed. This is the posterior um, chamber, sometimes called the posterior segment or the vitreous humor. And then the retina is attached back there on the choroid. So you don't actually see the retina unless it's detached. It's just confluent with the, with the choroid. And so it's the lack of seeing this, you know, thin undulating membrane in the back of the eye that is, um, that's, that's normal. And then finally, this is where the optic nerve sheath comes down back here. So I'm going to go through some pathology here. This is what a globe rupture looks like. Um, this patient was stabbed in her eye. And um, once again, proves my theory, you can't die from a stab wound. Um, we see so many stab wounds in the emergency department, and almost nobody dies from them. It's pretty amazing how... Um, what little damage, in, and, and now when I'm watching a movie, and they're like, somebody breaks out a knife, I'm like, okay, come on, you can't kill people with a knife. Um, but uh, now gunshot wounds, on the other hand, you definitely can see uh, deaths with, and if you get a gunshot wound to the eye, you can imagine where the bullet's going into the brain and stuff, so that's no good. But this is what a, a globe rupture looks like after um, a gunshot wound. And now with the globe rupture, I want to be clear, this is the patient's other eye, by the way. This is what the normal eye would look like. Um, there's this vitreous humor back here, and if you put any pressure on a globe rupture, even the smallest amount of pressure, you can squirt out, squish out whatever vitreous is left, and you could, which could result in the patient requiring a permanent enucleation of their eye, meaning their eye would have to be removed. And so your goal, whenever you have somebody you're concerned about globe rupture in, is to not touch the eye with anything. You want to get an ophthalmologist right away, okay? So many ophthalmologists would say, well, listen, this is a total contraindication to put a probe on an eye with a potential globe rupture. But my, my point to you is that chill the gel, dump it in the orbit like an ice cream cone, you know, like one of the soft serve ice cream cones, and put the probe on the gel. It doesn't even have to go anywhere near the eye, okay? That's the idea. Well, whenever we worry about globe ruptures. Um, but if any ophthalmologist ever asks you, you would, you would always say, oh, I would never put an ultrasound on a globe rupture. Are you kidding me? But, you know, because <laughs> their point is good, though. Their point is, well, you're going to get a CT scan these patients anyways, and the CT can really make out the anatomy very well in the eye as well. So why would you do an ultrasound? And they're right. And if I know I'm going to CT with this patient, I don't do that. But this patient was very unstable and couldn't get a CT scan. And I just wanted, and there was so much blepharedema. I mean, it was crazy. So that was the only way I was going to get that diagnosis. Otherwise, putting paper clips under the eyelids and prying them open would cause a lot more pressure and potential for, um, I think, um, worsening of the globe rupture. So 
in certain clinical situations where the patient can't get a CT scan, this is one other way to, to observe. Other things we can see a lens dislocation. This is the lens here that got dislocated. There's a lot of um, vitreous hemorrhage as well going on here after this blunt force trauma to the eye. I had a lens dislocation on my, not last night's shift, um, but the previous, I worked Monday night also overnight, and I had a guy, I had two patients with, with eye problems. One person was working at Ikea at, at night, um, like stocking the shelves, and a glass fell off, broke in her eye, and caused a globe uh, perforation and rupture. And uh, she went straight to the operating room at like two in the morning. Um, and then the other one was a guy whose girlfriend took a crowbar and got him right in the eye with it. And um, and he had a lens dislocation. He had a pretty he had a pretty fantastic lens dislocation, uh, and also had um, both that and a retinal detachment. It's pretty pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I I don't I don't know. You know he must have said something, but who knows? Crowbar to the eye. Hard to imagine that was an accident. Um, I don't ask the details, although sometimes it is fun to ask the details. Yes? So is there some kind of material like you can use? Somebody asked that last time. I don't, I'm not an ophthalmologist. Um, I, there really, there's nothing you could do except leave the eye alone and get an ophthalmologist involved as soon as possible. That's what I would say. It's, you, it's not like you can take some, you know, saline, inject it in there or something. I don't know. No, just, just don't do anything to it. Leave it alone. Right, yeah, they get they have to become enucleated. They take the eyeball out a lot of times and then put a, you know, a prosthetic eye in. So, anyways, um, this is an intraocular foreign body. We can see it here, and we can see another patient with one that's settled out more posteriorly down here with shadowing. These are both metallic foreign bodies. Something explodes, shrapnel goes everywhere, gets into the eyes, and... There's about 200 um, of those uh, handheld ultrasound machines in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I've trained two military fellows now for a year each to go and work there, and they have told me some fantastic stories about um, shrapnel in uh, intraocular form bodies, basically, from some of those uh, blast injuries. Um, anybody know what papilledema is? Have you heard of this term, papilledema? So basically, um, papilledema is swelling of the optic disc uh, that's caused by increased intracranial pressure. Okay, so let's say you had um, a subarachnoid hemorrhage or bleeding in the brain. You had a, right? So for whatever reason, you either have an aneurysm that bursts in the brain or maybe you have a gunshot wound to the head or something, and there's bleeding in your brain, and the brain is in the skull, and the skull is very rigid. It's got no, the brain has nowhere to go. It can only go out the frame and moragnum, which is frame and magnum, which is called herniation, and when the brain herniates through the frame magnum, it is done. Okay, the patient's, there's no recovery, no recovery. And so one of the early signs that the pressure is rising in the brain from an intracranial process going on is papilledema. Now, papilledema is what you're seeing here on this um, fundoscopic or ophthalmoscope, and, uh, and again, tough to see, uh, I think, to differentiate from a, a normal one. Uh, but this is, this is what it looks like here. It's basically blurring of the optic disc. And with ultrasound, it's actually quite easy to discern when somebody has papilledema because um, essentially what happens is the subarachnoid space um, that surrounds the brain is normally filled with that cerebral spinal fluid, but, um, but the subarachnoid space around the optic nerve is not normally filled with subarachnoid space, though those two spaces are contiguous. So what happens is when you have high intracranial pressure, um, the subarachnoid space surrounding the optic nerve actually starts to dilate, okay? And the pressure, um, pressurized CSF or cerebral spinal fluid starts going into that, um, that optic nerve sheath and you get um, basically widening or dilating of that optic nerve sheath diameter. And you can see that very easily on ultrasound. The, um, there's free transfer. It turns out that there's direct communication uh, between the subarachnoid space of the optic nerve and the chiasmal cistern of the brain. And so there's free transfer of CSF between these two um, compartments. So an intracranial pressure rises from one of those reasons. Usually it's a burst aneurysm. Um, and the patients have tremendously altered mental status. And so we can't ask them, say, do you have a headache or what's going on? They're just like altered and, you know, barely able to breathe. Um, this is one way to find out why somebody might be altered. 
Okay, so there's a laundry list of things that cause altered mental status. You know, you can imagine everything from an electrolyte disorder all the way to seizures to psychiatric reasons to intracranial pressure rises. And so this is one way to assess for um, an intracranial pressure rise. Now, the, the best way to really assess for it is to place a, um, um, a pressure monitor into the brain itself. You drill a hole in the skull and you put this pressure monitor in there and then you could directly measure the pressure in centimeters of water. So optic nerve sheet diameter is a non-invasive surrogate way to assess somebody who could have in increased intracranial pressure. That term surrogate marker, you're going to hear that all the time. It basically means you're not directly measuring something, you're looking at something else that gets jacked up in the setting of some pathology that serves as a surrogate marker. And surrogate markers can have different um, test characteristics depending on how good they are. So anyways, this is where you measure it. Um, it turns out that it's only the uh, distal aspect of the optic nerve sheet that really widens out. Further down here, proximal to the brain, it doesn't widen out as much. So you're going to go only on the three centimeter, three millimeters from the back of the eye. You're going to measure three millimeters back, and then you're going to measure the width of that optic nerve sheath right there. Okay, so it's at three millimeters behind the eye. And um, this one here measures 6.21, which is elevated. Um, and uh, I'm going to get to those numbers here in a minute. This is the other way to measure directly. You drill a hole into the, to the skull and you connect that to a pressure monitor and then you can tell like this person's got this big brain bleed here. All the white stuff here on the, on the CT scan is blood. And so there's blood in the ventricle, there's blood out here, uh, subarachnoid bleeding and there's, the brain is swelling, there's nowhere for the brain to go and the pressure's rising and you're getting papilledema and the optic nerve sheath is widening out. Does that all make sense? Um, these are the numbers here, and there's been several studies looking at what a normal um, pressure is. And Dr. Rosen, who's an intensive care doctor here at UC Irvine, he did an interesting study in patients. Um, he's, he's just writing it up right now. He enrolled, um, I don't know, 80 patients or so, and um, all patients had intracranial pressure monitors in that, that thing you saw into the brain, and he looked at their sheath diameters. And like other studies have done, um, he correlated that with um, increased intracranial pressure. And so it turns out that the upper limit for adults is probably up to 6 millimeters, and for kids it's 4.5 millimeters. Once it's greater than that, um, it course correlates as a surrogate marker for increased intracranial pressure, the width of that optic nerve sheath at 3 millimeters behind the back of the eye. And so um, this one right here is 6.4 millimeters in width, measured 3 millimeters behind the eye. And this is kind of how you do it. So first thing they're doing is getting the three millimeter mark. And so they measure it down until it reaches, this number reaches 3.0. And then at that location, they measure the width of that shadow that's coming down from the back of the eye. And if that's greater than six, then um, essentially you're telling whoever you're working with, the patient's got papilledema. All right. Now, the retina can, can detach away from the back of the chorus, as I mentioned, and, but it's always tethered at one of two locations, at both locations, at the optic nerve and at the aura uh, serrata. So this is just a diagram showing the aura serrata out here, the optic, and, and the retina is actually pulling back away from uh, the, the choroid seen down here. And this is what a retinal detachment kind of schematically looks like. And again, always attached at those two points. And this is an example here of a retinal detachment. You see that, that uh, fine um, undul undulating uh, thin tethered membrane back here in the eye, and um, this is uh, an, another example of one here um, coming up next. We can see this hyperechoic line seen in the back of the eye as the patient's eye is moving around, as you're moving the transducer around, you'll see that this gets tethered here. At the that, that was the optic nerve sheath kind of off out of the plane of sight, out of the plane of view, and the um, as you fan through it, you can see this retina coming off the back of the eye. Pretty easy to see. We've had over 100 cases of this. Um, it was sort of uh, picked up in the last few years in the emergency department at UCI. This is another example here of, a, of just a, this hyperechoic, undulating, uh, tethered membrane in the back of the eye. And as I fan through it, um, I really need to increase my depth in order to see that optic nerve sheath to make sure that it's, that it's tacked down at that region of the optic nerve sheath. This is uh, another example of a retinal attachment. I can see it's really just really detached um, quite severely here. But uh, again, it's the concept of the tethered uh, membrane. 
and um, this, this is a sort of still image of, of when you can really see the retina coming off the back of the eye there very easily. Um, now there's this concept of the Mac on, the Mac off that I want to just retell you. Here's your optic nerve sheath, and this is lateral. So which eyeball is this? You have to indicate to the patient's right. Good, left eye. So um, because this is medial, and this is to the patient's right, or this is nasal, and this is um, lateral over here. So this is, if this the, op does that make sense? Okay, okay, cool. Sometimes I say it backwards because I'm looking at you guys and you're looking at me, but um, so, so this is the optic nerve sheath right here, and so just lateral to it, you can see the retina is already detached off the back of the choroid where the macula is. That's what the arrow is kind of like where the macula would be. I can't see the macula specifically in ultrasound, but that's, that's the idea. Uh, here's uh, an example here of somebody who's got, you know, now, we've, now we're looking um, at the other eye. This happens to be um, the patient's right eye, and this is where the macula would be. Here he says right here. Um, this is where the macula would be here. It's lateral to the optic nerve sheath, and the retina is indeed detached at that point. Um, and as we fan through the video, it's kind of interesting. I like how you can see how it's tethered right down there. See how it just comes down, and boom, it locks in right here at that optic nerve sheath. And it gets tethered up here at the aura serrata on both sides. That's a very classic looking Mac off detachment. Most of the detachments we see, unfortunately, are Mac off detachments. Um, that's an example there of that Mac on detachment you saw from the earlier case. Here's the optic nerve sheath. It's still attached at the macula, and then here it is coming off the macula lateral to um, where it's attached at the macula. Now, there's this globe or vitreous body. Um, the, the vitreous body can actually pull off the back of the retina. So the retina is still attached on the choroid, but now that gelatinous substance that is the vitreous body can pull off the back of the retina. And when it does so, it doesn't get tethered at the optic nerve. And so it's difficult sometimes to discern whether you're looking at a detached vitreous body or a detached retina, okay? And so the detached vitreous body can completely pull away from the back of the eye. The retina is tethered at the optic nerve. So that's kind of how you tell the difference. Um, this is the, the sort of concept. And you'll see some echoes here also. If you overgain the image a little bit, you'll make out the vitreous body. When it, when it does pull away from the back of the eye, it gets a little bit congealed, okay? And some people describe that on the kinetic exam as um, clothes in a dryer. I'll show you that in a minute. So that's the detached vitreous body. It's completely pulling away from the back of the eye. For example, here's the optic nerve sheath, and here's what I initially thought was a retinal detachment, but it's not. This is a detached vitreous body because it's not tethered at the optic nerve. Another example of detached vitreous body, we can see the whole thing is basically pulled off the back of the eye. There's my, there's my optic nerve sheath there I saw a second ago. And so it's pulled off at the optic nerve sheath, that's what makes us a detached vitreous body and not a retinal detachment. Another example of a detached vitreous body here. And again, you know, the technique involved, the more I've gotten better at this, the more I really overgain these now. This is back before I was overgaining it. If you overgain this, you'll see really nice echoes here in the vitreous body that's pulling away from the back of the eye. Another example here of um, a situation where I'm not sure whether I'm looking at a detached retina or detached vitreous body, I can't tell. I don't see the optic nerve sheath anywhere on the still image, so if I just was given the still, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So that's something to keep in mind. Again, video, fan all the way through structures and determine their anatomic origins. This is just another still image of um, this, what looked initially like a retina, but it turns out this is the optic nerve sheath right here. It's really narrow, but that's the optic nerve sheath there, so it's detached right at the optic nerve sheath. It's a vitreous body detachment. This one um, is a kinetic exam. As the patient moves their eye, all this stuff is tumbling like clothes in a dryer. I don't know if you can appreciate that or not, but that's, that's sort of the idea. The probe came off the skin here. That's what this shadow is. They should get some more gel. But as, see how the patient moves their eye? It tumbles around like that. Again, overgaining it, you can see those subtle echoes back there. That's the idea for a detached uh, vitreous body. And we can see it's pulled away from the back of the optic nerve sheath as well.
And then vitreous hemorrhage, you can um, get echogenic material down there in the posterior segments. Sometimes it looks like little bright dots, punctate dots, and sometimes they congeal together to make clots and you get curvilinear echogenic structures. Um, and when it's really chronic, you can actually have these membranes back there. But this is a patient who's got this blaring out vitreous hemorrhage. You know, the depth is down at 4.7. We're wasting all this screen real estate. We should decrease our depth. That'll take advantage of this whole thing would be much larger if you did that. But we can see this, um, this vitreous hemorrhage back here in the back of the eye, those echoes um, layering out. So that's essentially it. Um, just the main points here, I, I don't ever want you to get in trouble by putting an ultrasound probe on anybody with a suspected globe rupture. Uh, you'll really you know, shake the bee's nest if you do that. Um, if somebody really puts you to the test and, and the patient's unstable and they can't go to a CT scan, that would be the time to consider using it. Uh, also, um, you will want to be mindful of how much um, scanning you're doing of somebody's eye. Um, not that there's any bio effects, negative bio effects ever determined or shown from this, but keep in mind that whenever you activate Doppler, it, it's definitely an increase in energy going into uh, the body. And so when if I was going to use Doppler on an eye, uh, which I don't really feel the need to really ever do, but some people like to look at the central retinal vein and artery and the optic nerve to look for occlusions there, just thinking downstream a little bit. Just keep in mind when you're using Doppler, you really need to limit your um, scan time because the eye gets hot um, uh, with the Doppler. There's more, there's more of a thermal index that's happening there. And, um, and air, when somebody's got a lot of subcutaneous air, usually it's from trauma, like a gunshot wound there, um, or somebody has a fracture in their sinuses and the air is coming out of the sinus into the space around the eye. Um, that can be sometimes very difficult then to visualize the eye because air is the enemy of ultrasound. So we talked about uh, these different things. I want today in the hands-on scanning session, I want you to first look at the carotid um, artery in the long axis, short axis. Go back to long axis, look for the, for the bifurcation of the carotid, identify what's known as the carotid bulb right at the bifurcation of the internal and external carotids. Get an idea on that. Put some color on the carotid and, and you know, work with the PRF a little bit. And then uh, measure that posterior um, wall of the carotid, the internal medial thickness. And uh, while you're in the neck, take a look at the, the jugular and then come down to uh, where the thyroid is, transverse view of the thyroid, sagittal view of the thyroid, throw some Doppler on that, get a good you know, picture of the vasculature there, and then, um, and then move on to the eye.